Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we are going to continue with uh, where we left off last time. Uh, and uh, if you remember, we were talking about how to get a networking layer that we can build interesting distributed applications out of. And uh, basically, layering is our technique here. We're going to build complex services out of simpler ones. And so we started with the, the uh, IP datagram service, uh, which is basically a way of getting unreliable messages to route from um, one point to any other point in the network. And uh, from that, we're going to build up something more interesting. Okay. And uh, the reason we need to do this is the physical layer or the link layer that's uh, this next layer up is pretty limited. So packets are of limited size, which is often called a minimum, uh, maximum, excuse me, transfer unit um, of uh, 200 or to 1500 bytes maximum. Uh, except in very special circumstances in uh, server rooms and so on where it can get larger. And routing is limited to within a single link. And so that doesn't help us much uh, if we want to go across the planet. And so our goal is basically to show how to go from the physical reality of packets, which are limited in size, unordered, uh, unreliable, only machine to machine, only on the local area network, and asynchronous and insecure, into an abstraction that helps us build interesting systems, which is arbitrarily sized messages, uh, ordered, reliable, process to process, rather than just machine to machine, routed anywhere, and uh, synchronous and secure. And our first uh, step down that path was basically wrapping the IP datagram with uh, an additional piece of information uh, to basically give us a uh, process to process routing. And our example of that was the UDP protocol, which is IP protocol number 17. And uh, basically we took the IP header, which was 20 bytes, that was machine to machine, and we added another uh, two 32-bit uh, source and destination, or 32-bit uh, entities here, which include a 16-bit source port and a 16-bit destination port. And basically that minimal header gives us the ability to route from a process on one machine at one IP address to a process on another machine at another IP address. And the way we, we do that is by supplementing the uh, physical name with a port, okay? And uh, the important aspect of this, uh, UDP is extremely low overhead. We just added um, basically eight extra bytes uh, to the IP header. And uh, oftentimes the UDP can be used for streaming services uh, that might be audio or video, uh, et cetera, where we wanna have low overhead. Unfortunately, you can often use this in an antisocial way if you're basically shoving way too much data down the pipe and uh, blocking everybody else out. And so we're going to talk about something a little more social when we get into TCP IP. So the problem with UDP still is it's unreliable. So if we send a message uh, down from one process to another process, we're not guaranteed that it's going to arrive. And uh, in that uh, checksum, helps us identify corrupted packets, but it doesn't help us make sure that packets arrive. And so um, basically any physical network can garble or drop packets in one way or another, just because errors uh, due to noise and other things can uh, cause that uh, transmission to fail. And uh, good examples uh, of that, for instance, is in a low power scenario, you might wanna try to be transmitting as low power as possible uh, just to, keep your energy usage down. And so then you're gonna start dropping packets uh, and uh, you need to do something about it. The other part that's kind of often not thought of in terms of uh, lost transmissions is congestion. And so this is a situation where the data has arrived properly at some intermediate hop, but uh, what actually happened was there wasn't any buffer space at that intermediate router and the router was forced to essentially drop the packet. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about congestion as we go forward as well. And as I mentioned, when I said UDP is uh, uh, not necessarily uh, social or is antisocial, it's because you might ignore the congestion problems and go ahead and try to shove all your data through anyway and uh, cause everybody else's packets to be dropped. So we want to get reliable message delivery on top of this unreliable IP datagram uh, network. And so this really means, uh, among other things, that we need to make sure that packets actually make it to the receiver. And uh, we want every packet to arrive at least once and at most once. Uh, 
Now, why do I uh, say at most once? Well, as we'll see, our, uh, one of our primary techniques for reliability is going to be retransmitting on failure. And it's quite possible that uh, we have uh, an erroneous assumption when we thought that the packet didn't make it. And so we send it again. And as a result, we end up with two packets. So that can be a problem. And we can combine this with ordering. So if we have a bunch of packets that go forward um, and we want to make sure they arrive in the same order at the destination that we sent them, um, perhaps the same mechanism for uh, reliability and ordering can be used. And we'll see that that's true. So that's actually going to be using acknowledgments. So uh, as a simple example here, how do we ensure transmission? Here we have a communication between A and B. So A sends a packet to B. B sends an acknowledgment. So what did we find out at that uh, standpoint? Well, we found out that the packet arrived at B. Um, and uh, basically, the receiver is just sending this act to tell us that uh, the packet arrived. And if we're checking checksums, et cetera, we can uh, essentially say that the packet arrived correctly. Uh, now, what happens if the packet is transmitted and uh, it doesn't arrive? Well, eventually, A is not going to see the act, and so it's going to time out and it's going to send the packet again. And eventually, we get an ACK. So notice that this technology that we're using here is going to let us make sure that the packet arrives at least once. But as you can imagine, it may not help us with duplication. So it's quite possible that this packet was sent, and it got delayed for a long time. And uh, so it didn't really get lost. And then A sent it again, and then B gets two copies of it. Okay. So some questions about this is, if the sender doesn't get an ACK, does that mean the receiver didn't get the original message? No, because I just told you that. It's possible that the packet will still arrive at B later. What if the ACK gets dropped? Well, if the ACK gets dropped, uh, then we might keep resending. Um, that's another problem that might come out here, because ACKs are unreliable. And if you remember when we talked about the general's paradox uh, a couple of lectures ago, the issue there was really that messages uh, going along with messengers in both directions were unreliable. OK, so um, we need to do something a little bit uh, about this to deal with the fact that our acts can get lost and our packets can get duplicated, et cetera. So how do we deal with message duplication? Well, the solution here is to put sequence numbers into our packets. So the sequence numbers um, are going to be a monotonically increasing number that we put in the message. And so if uh, a message with the same sequence number that we've already received shows up, we know it's a duplicate. Okay, And so the receiver is going to check for duplicate uh, numbers and discards if it's duplicate. Now, the requirement here is that the sender needs to keep the copy of all the messages it hasn't gotten an ACK on yet so that it can retransmit. And the receiver needs to keep track of all of the sequence numbers um, that might still be in flight so that it can throw out duplicate messages. And uh, what's hard about the this uh, second requirement here is uh, the receiver needs to figure out when it's OK to forget about received messages. Um, it needs to somehow have an idea that those messages uh, with those sequence numbers are no longer in the, in the network. So here's a very simple option, which is basically our sequence numbers are exactly one bit. Uh, and that bit's either 0 or 1, obviously. And so what happens is we send a message at a time. And uh, A starts with sequence number 0, and it sends a message with sequence number 0 to B. And when it gets an act back on 0, it'll send uh, sequence number 1 um, to B. And then it gets an act, and then it goes back to 0. And assuming that uh, we don't have uh, messages that stay in flight for a long time, this uh, one bit sequence number space is enough to help us with this uh, duplication problem at the receiver. Okay, So the pros of this, of course, it's very simple and it's a very small overhead. Uh, the cons are it's poor performance. Now, why is this poor performance? Well, if this is a long path between A and B, and we're sending one packet at a time and then waiting for the requirement, or for the act, excuse me, the, the acknowledgment to come back, what we know is that uh, this path is mostly empty. So all of the buffers between A and B are uh, mostly empty because we're only sending one packet at a time. And if you think about this, this little thought experiment, what we really want is something uh, more like wire latency 
times the throughput here so that we can fill up all of the queues on the way from A to B and on the way from B to A to maximally utilize our network and have maximal throughput. And so this alternating bit protocol is definitely not helping us here. It's just not allowing enough packets in flight. And if the network can delay for arbitrarily long, so if a packet could go from A and then take a, I don't know, a run around Australia and come back uh, before it goes to B, then uh, the, the one bit's not gonna be enough to uh, suppress duplication either. So let's put some more bits into the um, X. And so here's a simple idea here, which is a window-based acknowledgement. Uh, and it's a windowing protocol that's not quite TCP, and you'll see why in a moment. But here we have A and B, and the idea is we're gonna send up to N packets without an ACK, and that means that we have to have log N bits or uh, the ability for N different sequence numbers. Um, and this is gonna allow us to pipeline because we can send a packet with sequence number zero, one, two, three, and four, and they can be in flight. And then we can have, uh, they can get in queued at the destination side, assuming that the queue is big enough to hold N packets. And then um, we can uh, have the ACKs come back and sort of when we see an acknowledgement zero, then we can reuse that act number and so on. Okay, and so an act really says, in some sense, received packets up to sequence number X, time to send more. So acts are serving a dual purpose here. Basically, they're giving us a reliability aspect, which is uh, confirming that the packet's actually received, and it's allowing reordering to happen here. So if you imagine, for instance, that these packets were sent out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, but then they get reordered in the network, uh, and then they arrive, 4 arrives first. Well, we know, because we're expecting sequence number 0, we know that there are some other packets that are either lost or still on the way. And so if we wish, we could, in fact, not acknowledge uh, packet 4 until we get the ones before it so that we make sure that we have everything uh, in order and, uh, and the sequence number really says that everything up to that sequence number has been received. And if a packet gets garbled or dropped, uh, the sender times out and it resends something. So um, the question here is, will B still act for uh, packet four uh, if it failed to receive packet three? So the answer to that question is really dependent on the protocol. So the, you, could, you can design them multiple ways. You can act four immediately, even when you don't have three yet, because the, uh, the sender can know something about it. Or you could wait to act four until you get three. Uh, and that's what that's doing for you, is it's making sure that you don't overwhelm the queue at the destination. Uh, because if we act four too early, um, and we're still trying to wait for zero, one, two, and three, and it starts sending five, then we may run out of queue space at the destination. So it depends a lot on your queue management as well. Okay. Um, should the receiver discard packets that arrive out of order? That's a question. Uh, it's very simple to do that. So if we get packet four early, we could just throw it out and uh, assume that A will eventually retransmit. Um, the other thing is we could just put it in the queue and keep track of the fact that we haven't received everything up to there yet and uh, fill it in as we go. So these are um, different options, okay? And so the alternative is to basically keep a copy until the sender fills in the missing pieces and it reduces the number of transmissions, but things get a little more complicated. Okay. Um, and what if the acts are garbled? Well, uh, we just time out and resend. And what's good is if we time out and resend, say packet three, but packet three was already received, uh, the destination knows that uh, packet three was already received and it could throw out that extra at the destination while still sending the ACK because it'll assume that the reason it was retransmitted was there wasn't an ACK. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a basic windowing protocol because we're sendo sending a window of packets um, of size five here. And uh, when it becomes a sliding window, what happens as soon as we get packet zero and we send that up to the application, then we can go on and acknowledge say five, et cetera. Okay, and that's now we're getting into what TCP does. Okay, are there any questions on this so far? So this is not TCP, by the way, this is just basic windowing. Okay, are we good?
So uh, what does TCP do? Well, TCP is a stream-based reliable protocol. It's IP protocol six. So if you go back to the IP header uh, of a few lectures ago, you'll see that um, there's the IP protocol number, which is eight bits. And so a six fits in there for TCP. And the idea here is that you stream bytes in and they stream out in the same order at the other side reliably. And so what you see here is that, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G has already come out on the other side, um, but the rest of the alphabet until we get to S is somewhere in the middle here. And so it's a stream in, stream out. And um, basically what's uh, important to notice is because it's stream in, stream out, there's no explicit message boundaries in the high level API, but rather just you put some uh, bytes in and they come out in the same order. And uh, you might put in ST and then UV and then WX as separate uh, calls on one side, but they may come out together on the other. And so it's really only the guarantee that uh, all the bytes that go in uh, come out in the same order. Okay, and it's up to you to put any uh, message boundaries on that if that's what you wish to do. So some details here. So fragments, uh, the byte stream into packets inside. So the packets are entirely hidden from the API. And so if I put in a really large uh, amount of data all at once into, um, into one side of TCP, it will separate it into a bunch of packets so that it meets the minimum transfer unit size, maximum transfer unit size, I kept saying, keep saying that, um, so that uh, none of the packets in here are too big, it'll fragment, and uh, the other side, it'll put things back together, okay? And so we wanna avoid ex uh, exceeding the maximum. And um, inside, IP itself may do additional fragmentation. So both TCP and IP may fragment and everything gets put together back at the destination. Um, it's going to use a window-based acknowledgement protocol based on this, uh, the fact that we're sending bytes in and bytes out. So it's going to be a little different than the previous one where we're putting acknowledgements based on sequence numbers based on packet IDs. Here we're going to put them based on bytes, okay? And so, um, and the window uh, is going to reflect storage at the receiver so that the sender doesn't overrun the receiver's buffer space. So we want to make sure that we don't go ahead and send packets off that then are gonna to have to get dropped at the receiver because there's not enough space. Uh, so that's basically part of this protocol is to make sure that we don't overwhelm the buffers, okay? Um, and the other thing that we wanna do is we, uh, on the flip side, we would like to fill all of the queues up between point A and point B so that we get the maximum throughput out of this, okay? And so TCP has kind of got these um, almost contradictory requirements. One, don't put in so much that you get dropped uh, packets at the destination or even in uh, intermediate routers. And on the other hand, make sure that enough can get in there so that you're filling all the queues up. And so that's where an adaptive protocol has to come into play. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and we're all automatically retransmit all the lost packets and adjust the rate of transmission so that if we start losing packets in the middle because all the queues are filling up, we slow down. And that's where we become good citizens. So that if other people are going through that router and there's a, um, a link that's shared that's uh, lower bandwidth, uh, we will automatically slow down to adapt so that um, we're good citizens and everybody gets to share the bandwidth. Okay, and so that's fundamentally how TCP is, uh, one fundamental difference between TCP and UDP is that TCP is uh, a good citizen protocol. So I'm gonna show you, uh, an example here in a moment where we actually walk you through some of the sequence numbers, but I wanna talk about the space of sequence numbers. So the space of sequence numbers um, are based on bytes that are transmitted. And, and so they start um, at an arbitrary point that's randomly chosen when the connection's made. And um, so at the destination uh, or at the source, excuse me, we basically have uh, those sequence numbers that have been sent Okay, and these represent bytes that have been sent. There are ones that have been sent and are in the network but haven't been acknowledged yet. And then there are the ones that haven't been sent yet. Okay, and so that's the space of sequence numbers. And this space again is byte based. Okay, and the receiver basically has uh, sequence numbers that have been received and given up to the application. And notice that there are some that were sent at the, at the uh, sending side 
that um, have been received and even given to the application yet, but the sender doesn't know that because it hasn't received the ax yet. And then there are uh, things that, uh, bytes that are sitting in the buffer at the receiver side. And again, those are ones that have been sent but not acknowledged yet. And then there are uh, bytes that haven't been received yet at the receiver. And so we can see that there's some that were sent for some sequence numbers that were sent at the sender that aren't received yet. And then there's, of course, the ones that haven't been sent and they haven't obviously been received yet. Okay. And so the sequence number space is uh, fundamentally byte based. Okay. So here we go. I want to show you an example. Now, the sequence numbers arbitrarily start uh, at, the, uh, at the time of connection. I'm going to say they started at 100 here, just for illustration. And this is going to represent the receiver's buffer, okay, window. And what happens is uh, over on the right here, I'm going to show the acts that have been received by the sender. And so right now, what we're going to say is that um, we've acknowledged everything up to byte 100 or sequence number 100, and we can take another 300 bytes, okay? And so the the uh, receiver is is advertising its window uh, fundamentally as it goes, okay? And so if you look, here we uh, just sent a packet from the sender side where the starting sequence number is 100, and it was of size 40, and it um, it showed up uh, at the receiver and it got put into the buffer, okay? And what happened is that buffer now has from sequence number 100 up to 140 or 139, uh, there's a chunk of bytes there. And so what do we uh, acknowledge? We acknowledge that uh, up to um, 140 uh, is the acknowledgement, which basically says that we have received uh, up to 139 and that there are now only 260 bytes left in the window. So notice that we've filled up 40 of our bytes and that's taken off our, uh, our window size here. And so why is this useful? Well, this is useful if we're, we don't have an application that can accept data and we fill this whole buffer up, the sender is, is watching that, okay? And so here's another case where we send a packet with sequence number 140 that gets put in here. It happens to have size 50 and uh, we acknowledge back uh, 190 and we only have 210 left, okay? Here's an example of uh, sequence number 230 uh, and size 30. So what happened here? Well, what happened here is uh, a packet got lost, okay? So the sender had sent this packet, but it never showed up somewhere. And so this, this packet uh, with sequence number 230, the sender sent it uh, happily uh, thinking that the packet with sequence number 190 had, uh, had already made it. And it didn't. And if you notice what TCP IP does is at this point, it only acknowledges up to 190 because that's the only continuous chunk of data that's been received. And notice also that the remaining buffer space hasn't changed, okay? And so as far as uh, the, the receiver is concerned, it's still saying that I've only gotten a contiguous set of bytes up to 190, even though it's got a chunk in its buffer that's already uh, been received further on than that. And notice that because we're advertising 190 slash 210, the sender is never gonna send too much data such that we go off the end of the buffer. It's always gonna send up to 210 bytes from sequence number 190, okay? And so let's keep going here. Um, here's another sequence number 260, still acknowledging the same way. Sequence number 300 still acknowledging the same way. So notice from the standpoint of the receiver, it's not getting acknowledgement for the data that it sent. So this is uh, seeming problematic, right? And it knows right now where the problem is. It knows that it was the packet from 190 that it sent um, that didn't get in there. And so at some point uh, we get a, a, a timeout at the sender and it retransmits the next packet that was missing, which is this uh, one starting at 190. And now we fill everything in and this, the, uh, the receiver says, oh, now I have everything uh, contiguously up to 340 and you can uh, send me 60 more. So, uh, so coding um, to data basically helps you uh, with the, uh, so the data doesn't get lost, okay? So it, as you're encoding your data, you're basically making sure that um, it's less likely that transmission errors are gonna occur.
okay? And so it becomes less likely to have these retransmissions. Um, the, uh, and then we're finishing up here. We have a sequence number 340, uh, and then finally sequence number 380, okay? And notice at this point, uh, at this point, um, the receiver is uh, acknowledging up to um, four, uh, sequence number 400, and, but saying, I, I have no buffer space. And so this is the point at which TCP IP, uh, the receiver window is fully shut down and TCP IP will uh, no longer transmit anything from the sender because it knows there's no space at the receiver. And so this is in fact how when you uh, Telnet or SSH into a remote machine and you, uh, you start typing, this is the flow control that will make sure that that, that um, channel doesn't try to transmit more than the receiver can get. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, now um, something which I, we're not gonna talk a lot of, we're not gonna talk about uh, today, is there's also a enhancements to this protocol um, called selective acknowledgement, which is uh, negotiated typically between uh, source and destination, and if that exists, then uh, it's possible to say uh, more clearly, for instance, in the case of a timeout, exactly which packets are missing. So if you have multiple holes with selective acknowledgement, you can actually say, well, I'm missing a packet here and a packet there. Uh, another question that's on the chat here is, uh, what happens when you run out of sequence numbers? Uh, well, when you run out of sequence numbers, it just wraps around to zero and it just keeps working, okay? Because Basically, the sequence number, uh, you're not going to have four gigabytes of, of data in, uh, in flight at once. Okay. All right. Uh, did that answer your question, Max? Um, so overflowing is not bad in this instance because uh, as long as you don't have uh, more data in flight than you can uh, support by... Um, 32 bits worth of sequence numbers, and it doesn't matter if they wrap around. Um, so uh, I don't know, what else can I explain here, Sebastian? Uh, can I, is there one piece in particular that is not making sense to you? So the exact time, who, the question here about who times out at this point, this is the sender times out because it's seeing that it's only been getting acknowledgements for, uh, packets up to 190 and it knows that it's been sending everything else or sending other things and so at that point it the the uh timeout happens and uh it starts retransmitting from 190 so that's the sender is timing out okay all right is that good any other questions Specific questions? Okay, so, um, so what you see here on this diagram, just to, to reiterate, is this is the receiver's window at the top. At the left, you see packets uh, coming into the receiver from the sender. And on the right, you see packets going out to the sender from the receiver. And they have acknowledgments on them. And what's interesting about this is if you look at the packet format for TCP IP. In fact, TCP IP is a bi-directional protocol. And so packets that you send to the other side, you're also putting acknowledgments in the header uh, for things you've received from the other side. So packets simultaneously acknowledge uh, in the header for data received at the same time they're sending data. And so it's, it's efficient from that standpoint. Packet sizes are basically determined. The question here is how do you determine packet sizes? Again, the answer is based on, uh, based on the MTU, so the maximum transfer unit between the source and the destination is one of the things that will chose uh, to make packets small enough to not get fragmented in the middle. The other thing is uh, if, if data has been sitting around buffered in a socket for too long, TCP will send it off as well. And so there's a dynamic kind of protocol here for deciding. All right, so now what about congestion? All right, so how long should timeout uh, be for resending messages? If you wait too long, you're wasting time if a message is lost. So in this instance here, um, 
if we waited too long to do this retransmission, then there's a whole bunch of data that's just not being sent and our queues all the way from source to destination are gonna shut down and our bandwidth is gonna be bad. Okay, but if it's too short, then we're gonna duplicate and send uh, retransmit too often. And um, this is bad, even though we're about to get an ACK, we're sending duplicate packets in there. And what's a little bit uh, counterintuitive here perhaps is if we retransmit too early thinking that we're making the connection better, what we're actually doing is filling all those queues up and making it more likely that things get dropped in the middle because we run out of buffer space. So you gotta be really careful to, to not retransmit too much, okay? And so there is a stability problem here, which is more congestion means the act is delayed, which means unnecessary timeout, which means more traffic, which means more congestion, which is closely related to the window size at the sender. Um, if it's too big, it means you're putting too much data into the network. So the, the, what I haven't shown you here is the sender has its own notion of how much data it's allowing to be outstanding. Now it can't have more data outstanding than the receiver's buffers, but it could have less. And it could choose to do less based on the fact that there's too much congestion in the, in the network, okay? So um, basically the sender needs to try to match the rate of sending with the rate that the slowest link can accommodate. So the sender actually uses an adaptive algorithm to decide the size of n, which is how much, uh, how many bytes are allowed to be outstanding. And the basic technique is, uh, you know, the goal is to fill the network entirely between the sender and the receiver while still being a good citizen. And the technique is to slowly increase the size of the window at the sender, more send more and more data until the acknowledgements start being delayed or lost, and then you know you've gotten too big and you've got too much data outstanding. And so TCP has a solution called slow start, uh, which is one of many uh, possible variants on this, which is you start sending slowly, that's what it means. And as long as you don't get timeouts, you basically increase the window size at the sender, more and more data gets sent uh, before acts by one for each act received. And then the timeout uh, causes you to basically decrease your window size by half. So this is uh, called additive increase, multiplicative decrease, and that's why you get this sawtooth, um, you get this uh, sawtooth behavior in TCP where you slowly ramp up the amount of data you're sending and then you quickly go down and then you ramp it up and so on. And that sawtooth is a pretty good uh, way of, of uh, adapting to the size of the queues. And I actually put up a paper, uh, there's a link off of the main schedule page about uh, a Van Jacobson paper from way back when, when this first version of this additive increase, multiplicative decrease was put together. Okay, but that's more 168 topics, which uh, we'll, uh, CS 168, so we'll uh, move on from that. Um, now, if you remember, uh, now we've got a secure TCP connection, which we had uh, when we looked at web servers way back at the beginning of the class, where uh, what happens is a socket that the client wants to make a connection with a socket at the server. And to do that, the server sets up its own server socket. And so the, the client requests a connection off a given port, and then the server generates a brand new connection between the client and the server, uh, which is, as you remember, a five tuple defines this uniquely, which is the client address client port at one side, the server address server port at the other, and a protocol in the middle, which in this case is TCP. Those are the five pieces. And uh, as a result, we have a nice reliable byte stream between client and server, and that in turn allows us to do things like uh, web servers and so on. And that port, which we just introduced uh, as part of putting a protocol on top of IP, so that's why this is TCP IP, uh, has many well-known uh, values like 80 or 443, our typical web ports, 25, send mail, et cetera. We talked about those earlier. And uh, network address translation allows basically there to be even more uh, connections between clients behind firewalls and servers than you might suspect given the number of IP addresses. And I'm not gonna go into that in great detail, but network address translation works roughly like this. If you have a client that's behind a firewall, they try to connect to say port 80, and they have a port of their own that they randomly get. And then when it goes through the firewall, it gets translated to the, to the public address, 
by basically having a mapping between the client's port and a port at the at the desk or at the um, firewall side. And so these connections actually, when they go through the firewall, these uh, five tuples are dynamically adjusted on the fly uh, so that there can be a whole bunch of client addresses that are private addresses behind the firewall. And you do that as long as you have unique client ports to identify them. And so that's what network address translation does. Okay, but let's look at this connection now that we have TCP IP. Clearly to set TCP IP up, we have to somehow come up with the sequence numbers and basically establish the overall protocol between source and destination that I was just talking about. And so um, the goal here is to agree on a set of parameters uh, between them, which is uh, basically a sequence number for both sides, for instance. And we need a good starting sequence number, which is the first byte in the stream, but we don't wanna to be too predictable about this. Because uh, if a, somebody in the middle were to know what the sequence numbers are, there have actually been demonstrated ways in which somebody can insert themselves in the middle of a yellow connection here by knowing what the sequence numbers are um, that are going between the client and server and then basically uh, causing a man in the middle attack. Okay, so we got the sequence numbers need to be unique enough and hard to predict uh, to avoid hijacking connections. Okay, and some ways of choosing the initial sequence number um, are things like, uh, well, one of the things we have to worry about is making sure that uh, the sequence numbers are, are randomly far away from previous connections so that, um, so that packets that are already in flight might not show up from a previous connection with, the, with a uh, new sequence number, okay? Um, and the simplest way to do all of this uh, basically is pseudo randomly increment the previous sequence number uh, and choose a new one. And there's a bunch of protocol implementations that basically have a pseudo random choice. Um, so a question that's on the, uh, on the chat from, a, from the previous slide here is when I connect to the internet through a firewall, is my client IP port visible to the server? Um, always the same. So the answer is the IP, uh, when you're connecting through a firewall here, the IP that the server sees is always the same because uh, that's the IP address of the firewall. Okay, the port uh, is usually different even without a firewall because the socket uh, connection between the server, the, so the client and the server needs to be unique. And so this client port is usually randomly chosen even when you don't have a firewall. So um, that's okay. Uh, no, no problem uh, with the question there. But um, certainly when you've got a firewall in the middle, there's gonna be yet another thing that's scrambling the client ports. Okay, so um, let me just show you briefly this handshake and then I wanna move on to something else. But uh, basically the setup is a three-way handshake where the client sends uh, a packet with a, with a SIN bit set and a, a proposed sequence number. The server accepts it, sends back uh, a SIN, for the reverse connection, as well as an ACK for this forward connection, and a proposed new sequence number. And then finally, um, we get uh, the ACK back. And so after we've gone uh, SYN, SYN ACK, ACK, uh, then we have established a two-way connection with X and Y sequence number starting points, okay? And so that's the, that's the three-way handshake, okay? And um, there's some interesting uh, issues with this where uh, if a, uh, an attacker sends a whole bunch of SYN packets to a server but then doesn't do anything else with it, the big problem with that is the server, uh, if it's not clever, uh, allocates a bunch of memory for every pending SYN. And as a result, you can cause the server to run out of memory. And so there's a bunch of tricks that you can do in terms of caching and cookies and so on that people use to avoid that. All right, and then closing, uh, again, the host sends a fin. When it's ready to close, host two acknowledges that that direction is closed, but it may have some additional data to send uh, its direction. And then finally it sends a fin and we get a fin act and now we're totally closed. Okay. And we can retransmit all of these in the process. All right. So now I wanna move on. So now that we've got a reliable way of making uh, connections, how do we build distributive protocols? Well, in general, 
Uh, once we've got a reliable connection, we're still going to do something like message passing because we set up a reliable byte stream, but then we um, do our own message uh, boundaries, maybe with a link followed by some data, and then we've got message passing between a sender and a receiver, and so now we've got reliable messages from point A to point B. And we can abstract that away to think of this as send a message to a message box at the receiver where what's a message box? Well, it's a unique, for instance, uh, IP port combination at the destination. Um, and so now we can think of once we've quickly, you know, under the covers established a TCP IP connection, then we can start sending messages to it and receiving messages from it. And this abstraction of a message box uh, for the sender and receiver now allows us to start doing things like, uh, oh, I don't know, building a two-phase commit protocol like we were talking about last time, for instance, okay? And so most of the distributed protocols that you are gonna run into are talked about in terms of sending messages. Uh, and, and so we're gonna think of it that way now moving forward as well. And we're gonna see what can we do that's interesting with a message-based protocol. So to do that, we need something possibly a little more uh, powerful than just a raw message, okay? Because this raw messaging is still a little too low level. So we've got reliability, which is great. But uh, if we're building something interesting out of the sending messages, we still have to wrap up all the information uh, into a message at the source. Uh, and then at the destination, we have to decide what to do with it. Uh, you know, if a message comes in, then what? Well, we unpack it and decide what to do. Maybe we need to sit and wait for a bunch of messages to arrive. Um, and even more subtle, but still kind of uh, painful is what if we have machines with different byte orders, like big Endian versus little Endian orders, okay? So you learned about that in 61C, uh, where a big Endian order is something where a 32-bit integer is uh, four bytes in a row where the first byte is the most significant byte. And a little endian architecture is one with the reverse where the first byte that comes over a pipe or is in memory is the least significant byte. You know, if you've got two machines and they're trying to communicate and they have different endian orders, that's a problem, okay? So, uh, you know, uh, computer science has gotten a long way by being uh, lazy in clever ways. And a very clever way to be lazy is to use a remote procedure call on top of our messaging, okay? And it basically is something which calls a uh, remote procedure on a, or calls a procedure on a remote mach machine, okay? And uh, you could think of a client call something like uh, remote file system read uh, from file rutabaga, and somehow through the networking and so on, it gets translated automatically into a call on the server, which uh, calls the local file system and reads uh, rutabaga from the file called rutabaga. So this abstraction of a remote procedure call is going to let us basically think uh, in the client side like we're just calling procedures, even though they're going all the way across to uh, a server and coming back. Okay. And so here's the RPC concept a little uh, uh, more basically here. So the client is calling function f with a couple of variables v1 and v2 and what really happens is they call on their local node and it goes into something called a stub so a stub is a is a piece of code that gets linked in to the client and it is special code that takes these arguments v1 and v2 and bundles them in some network transparent way uh, and sends it off to a server which, uh, where the server stub receives it and unbundles them and then makes a call to the local version, the remote version of uh, the function, which has a return value which now needs to be bundled back up to send back, okay? And then uh, the clients double unbundle it and receive it and, re and return it to the caller. And so the caller called F of V1, V2 and it got back R and that actually went across the network Okay, and so if we think about this from a network standpoint, there's actually a machine boundary being crossed here, two machines, and uh, some networking going on in the middle with some packet handling and so on. And so the TCP IP uh, with the mailboxes and, and uh, messaging abstractions are all happening uh, 
at, at this layer, and then we're, we're bundling stubs on top of that, and as a result, the client and server thinks they are calling procedures, okay? And what's good about this is not only does the client not have to think anything about messaging, but the, uh, they don't have to worry about endianness because the stubs automatically transmit, uh, transform uh, values in sort of from machine A into a uh, network neutral format typically, and then they're unpacked in, back into a format that B understands and vice versa. Okay, that's all done automatically by the RPC. Now the implementation of this is it's a uh, request response message passing under the covers. The stub provides the glue on the client and the server. The client stub is responsible for what's called marshalling the arguments and unmarshalling the return values. So marshalling is taking values and putting them together into a network packet and unmarshalling is taking them apart, okay? And so this depends on the system, but it uh, may convert values to some canonical form, uh, serializes objects, copies ar arguments, pass by reference and so on. So this marshalling process is potentially uh, complicated but it's being done automatically by these stubs i showed you earlier here okay um and uh so the question here is is the client stub code um something that you have to write and the answer is no i'm going to tell you about that in a second the question here is what is uh what's the difference between rpc and a generic serial serialization setup like google protobufs so the google protobuf is helping you with the um the uh, network independent formatting, but it's not helping you with the packaging um, automatically something up so you think that you've got a function here. So you could have uh, the proto buffs kind of on the back half of this if you wanted. Okay. Now, um, let me tell you a little bit about this. So um, the, the equivalence here with uh, regular procedure calls should be pretty clear. So the, uh, the parameters get put into the request message, vice versa, the result is put into a reply message. Uh, the name of the procedure is passed in the request message. The return address uh, is basically the return address of the client needs to be included in the, um, the connection with the sender to somehow make this work out properly. So the answer to the question about, do you have to come up with a stub is no. There's a, for whatever RPC technology you've got, um, there's something called a stub generator, which is a com compiler that generates stubs for you. The input is an interface definition in a special language called IDL, which basically defines all the functions that are going to be available remotely and what the types are of their arguments and return values. And then if you put that into the compiler and the names of the functions, it will generate the stubs. And then once you have the stubs, you get to link them on the, um, on the client and the server and voila, you have a remote system that will looks like you're making procedure calls. Now some cross-platform issues here. Uh, one is, as I said, these, these IDL languages know how to convert to and from canonical forms um, and tag things so that you know how things are encoded um, so that there aren't too many uh, conversions if, if uh, you can avoid it. Um, how does a client know who to talk to at the remote side? Well, that's a, what's called binding. And so you basically need to translate typically the name of some remote service into a network endpoint name, like a port and an IP address and so on, okay? And so that's the binding process. So any RPC has to basically talk to a binding service, which is just like DNS, but for the RPC. Um, and it's uh, another word for naming at the network level. And you can either have static uh, binding where, uh, every name for a given name it always maps to the same IP address or you might have dynamic binding which is a little more flexible happens at runtime so dynamic binding uh, most RPC systems have that use dynamic binding via some name service um, and the name service is again just like DNS but it's for the RPC so it's a little bit more complicated than D DNS because we're actually registering services like file service or um, something that's a database or whatever with this service. And when we connect to, a, uh, to one of these services, we're actually asking for the details of how to connect to that service remotely. Okay, and why do we want to do this dynamically? Well, for one, we can figure out who's uh, permitted to contact the access uh, 
the service itself and, and deny them up front. Um, and also fail over if uh, one hard piece of hardware fails, we can dynamically switch over to a new piece and uh, perhaps the clients only see a little blip in their service. And uh, we can also, if we have multiple servers, we can have some flexibility at binding time to choose one, which is uh, uh, what big web services like Google and Amazon uh, dynamically choose between a set of possible servers uh, that are outstanding at any one given time to try to balance load and so on. And we won't talk about that for now. Okay. Um, so some problems with RPC. So RPC is not a panacea for everything. Among other things, non-atomic failures. So uh, when we're on a local node and we're making a procedure call, mostly what we have to worry about is the machine crashing. And uh, if the machine crashes, then basically your um, don't care anyway because the, the application is crashed. With RPC, you now have a problem where the requester client side is making a request, but the receiver side crashes in the middle and now you have failures that are not atomic. They might be kind of in the middle of processing uh, some procedure call for you. Okay, and so there's many different types of failures here. Um, you could have a user level bug causes the address space to crash, machine failure cause uh, causes processes on the machine to failure. Um, some machines compromised by a malicious party causes one of many pieces to fail. Um, and if you have these types of failures, if you don't have RPC, the whole system is going to crash or die. And that's almost better maybe from a what really happened standpoint, because you know, whereas after RPC, you have machines compromised or crashed in the middle. And now we have to start worrying about how do we make a system distributed across multiple nodes behave well, even when some of them are failing or being malicious. And so now you can kind of see where, why we were talking about distributed consensus and Byzantine agreement. It's one of our tools in the box. Another is going to be um, replication and hashing, which is going to be our topic uh, for the rest, uh, as toward the end of the lecture and next time as we start talking about um, distributed key value stores. But these non-atomic failures, which could be distributed across multiple nodes, can easily give you an inconsistent view of the world. Uh, did your cache data get, you know, did your data get cached in one place but not in another? Or is the cache out of date? Or did the server actually do what you requested or not? Um, so these kind of interesting errors start coming into play. But you know what? Um, we're going to confront them because, uh, you know, the advantages of distribution is that you can basically potentially get more reliability if you can fail over uh, to things that are still operating when other things are down. Okay, so um, another problem which is probably obvious but I'd like to say it anyway is that RPC is not performance transparent. So the cost of a procedure call is much less than the cost of uh, say doing an RPC to another process on the same machine and it is much less than network RPC. Okay, and there's lots of overheads in RPC, marshalling, stubs, kernel crossings, communication, et cetera, that make it um, a very different animal from a uh, procedure call. So it's, it's why it's an RPC, not a PC. And so programmers need uh, to be aware that RPC is not free and you don't want to do RPC uh, just for the, the heck of it. You'd like to do it in a way that gives you some benefit of location transparency when that's a useful thing. Okay, and caching can help you, but now you start getting into some consistency problems, which we're going to address coming up. Okay. Um, so uh, what is RPC useful for? Well, RPC is useful for all sorts of things. Lots of services are actually uh, exported as RPCs, where you make remote procedure calls to services. Okay, and as I'll talk about in a moment, uh, the NS NFS file system is uh, was one of the first systems that really had a solid RPC as a, its underlying uh, implementation platform. So um, here's another way in which RPC is useful. So if you think about communicating um, cross domains, you know, how do, how do address spaces share uh, with one another? And we've talked up till now about things like shared memory, and we've talked about semaphores and monitors, et cetera. Uh, maybe reading and writing from a file system and pipes. So these are all things that you know, you're familiar with. Another is doing a remote procedure call 
between two different processes is a possibility. And what's interesting about doing that is if you uh, use RPC between uh, one process and another, then you can transparently move that process for load balancing reasons to another node uh, somewhere else in the network and your code will keep working just a little slower. Okay, so RPCs can be used to communicate between address spaces on different machines or on the same machine. And services can be run uh, wherever it's most appropriate. Um, access to local and remote services kind of look the same from a semantic standpoint. The performance is a little different. And there's lots of RPC systems out there, okay? If you know what to look for, um, there was a really large, uh, complicated one called CORBA, the Common Object Request Broker Architecture. Um, you use RPC. Uh, those of you that have uh, Windows boxes use it all the time when you have two applications that uh, communicate with each other. Um, oftentimes they're using uh, DCOM, which is a distributed RPC. Um, there's RMI, which is a Java remote method invocation architecture and so on. So there's many RPCs. Um, and one thing, I can't leave the topic of RPCs without talking briefly about microkernels. So uh, all of the kernels we've talked about so far in the term have all been this monolithic structure where what I'm showing you here in light blue is the part of the system that runs at kernel level with uh, extra privileges and the applications running on top are are basically uh, user applications okay a microkernel structure is one that's uh, the kernel space is much more limited okay there are uh, something that handles address spaces something that schedules threads um, so basically that's giving you processes and threads and then an RPC handling system that basically uh, is able to forward messages from one uh, user level process to the other. And that's it. That's the whole kernel. And what you do instead of what we did in the monolithic case is things that used to be in the kernel, like file systems, are now processes running on top of the kernel. And an application that's reading and writing from the file system is actually do does so by performing RPCs through the file system excuse me, through the, uh, through the microkernel, okay? So when an application is doing a read to a file, um, it's basically making an RPC call that goes through the microkernel and comes up to the file system and back, okay? And so why do this? Yeah, why not system calls? Well, the problem with system calls is in the application, uh, in the monolithic case, an application makes a system call, it's now in the domain in which uh, the file system is running, whereas, an application makes a system call here, that system call is merely into the microkernel. The microkernel doesn't know anything about um, file systems. Okay, and so the equivalent of what used to be a system call interface, the POSIX system call interface to the file system, is still available, but now it's a library that makes RPC calls into a file system uh, that's actually in another process. Okay, and so why split the OS this way? Fault isolation. So the, the original um, reason for building microkernels was basically to make a system where bugs in basic kernel services like windowing and file systems and paging, uh, those bugs might crash that component, but the system itself stays up. Okay, so it's a fault isolation. It also enforces modularity. Okay, so uh, you have to come up with a really good interface to the file system, um, even with the kernel, okay? And it's location transparent because if you have a particular thing that's running um, on a particular microkernel and it's uh, being bogged down because too many other things are running, then you can just migrate it to another uh, system and the RPC can be transparently forwarded uh, across to another, to another uh, node and you'll still get service. Okay. Um, and so the question also about how to, uh, what's the priority for the microkernel uh, in terms of scheduling system services, yes, they can be scheduled at higher priority. As you can imagine, there's a whole question about how to get uh, the right trade-off between um, the system services that might be uh, overusing the file system, overusing uh, resources. You don't want them to prevent anybody else from running and so on. So there's a delicate change there in uh, terms of uh, what priorities everything's at, and that's a whole nother discussion. Okay, so um, now let's move uh, on now. So once we've got a good messaging service, and maybe we use RPC to give us uh, transparency, 
of location and transparency of uh, hardware type, then we can start talking about building storage where the storage is actually out in the network somewhere. Okay, and this is uh, what we typically call network at, uh, attached storage. And uh, you're all very familiar with this. Uh, now, usually in, when we started with thinking about network attached storage way back when, uh, it was basically on your local network. Now, of course, network attached storage can span the cloud and uh, the distance you go is much further. But let's, let's uh, leave the distance uh, of uh, how far away our storage is for a conversation in a moment. But let's actually talk about uh, network attached storage a little more abstractly here. And uh, one of the questions uh, that comes up is once we put storage on the network, suddenly we can have multiple clients easily talking to that storage. Uh, and we can now start worrying about consistency. So when one uh, client does a write, when does it appear to the other clients, okay? That's called consistency. So when changes appear to everyone, uh, they appear in the same serial order. Um, another question might be availability, which is how do I know that I can get my result for sure? Because clearly if the, uh, the last hop network is down, then nothing's available. But uh, maybe there's a partition in the network somewhere that happens to uh, cut off part of the storage service, but not all of it. Is my data still available? And so we can start talking about availability in terms of our storage now. And we can also talk about partition tolerance, which is uh, how tolerant is this system to the network being arbitrarily chopped? Okay, so consistency, availability, partition tolerance. Okay, so again, consistency has to do with uh, how do rights appear to other people and in what order. Availability is can I get my uh, results for sure and partition tolerance is how tolerant is the system to maintaining its semantics even when parts of the system are uh, partitioned. And there is a, uh, it was really originally a conjecture um, that uh, was that um, you can only get two out of those three uh, consistency, availability, partition tolerance at once. Can never get all three. And it was informally called the CAP theorem, and it came from uh, Brewer, okay, Eric Brewer, who was a professor here for a long time. Um, and uh, he was really conjecturing that this was true. And then um, there was a uh, call for a bunch of papers a while back, and a bunch of people put in theorems about proving the CAP theorem. And it turns out that you have to be very careful about what your assumptions are and define things very carefully. And then you can prove the CAP theorem, okay? But there are many different proofs all depending on what your assumptions are. So we're not gonna go that far in this class, but we're gonna say uh, loosely speaking that the CAP theorem says you can only have two of these three things. You can have consistency and availability, but not partition tolerance, or you can have you know, availability and partition tolerance without consistency and et cetera. And let me just give you one example of this. So how can I have, uh, say, availability and partition tolerance but not consistency? Well, that says I put a cache on the client and I cache all the data. And uh, it doesn't matter what link I cut in this, I can always get my data, but I'm not going to see other people's rights. And so it's going to be inconsistent and so on. OK. So with that in mind, we can start talking about how do we build a distributed file system. So a distributed file system here is one in which the client is separated from the server over the network. And uh, maybe we do reads uh, across the network and we get our data back across the network. And so it's basically some mechanism for transparent files uh, stored on the remote disk to be gotten to, to users. And uh, in principle, what we can do is we can mount the remote files into our local file system. So for instance, slash home slash oxy slash 162 might be mounted on the laptop so that when you go to this with your file browser and you go down these directories and you look, uh, it turns out the moment you cross this boundary, you're actually talking to a part of your local file system, it appears, but really those are, that's really on the remote file server. Okay, and so the typically in a remote uh, distributed file system case, you can often mount 
file systems directly on the client. They look local, but your queries go remotely. Um, and so how do we do that? Well, here's a picture that I've shown you uh, kind of before of uh, the interiors of an operating system. And really, it says that somehow in the file system layers, we have the ability to have file systems that are both local and remote. Okay, and the way that this is happens is uh, there's special interfaces inside here called VFS that make it possible for us to mount block devices that, and uh, file system devices that are either local or remote, and everything above that layer doesn't know the difference. Okay, and so this virtual file system switch or VFS kind of has this idea that if you have users um, at the client processes above and they do um, open and uh, you know opens and reads and writes via the POSIX interface and closes, they will get the exact same interface regardless of whether they're talking to say um, an MS-DOS file system, a uh, FAT file system, or an EXT2 file system. Uh, the same APIs will be useful and that's basically due to this VFS layer. Okay, so VFS is a virtual abstraction similar to a local file system, gives you a virtual version of superblocks, inodes, et cetera, and it's compatible with a variety of different file systems, including remote ones. And it basically gives you the same system call interface above that's used for different types of file systems. But um, VFS was originally designed in a Unix environment. So even things like um, the MS-DOS file system below have to fake out the existence of inodes and super blocks to the VFS layer in order to be compatible with that. So that's a little bit strange. But basically it's a uh, VFS common file model in, in Linux basically has a model that file systems uh, have super blocks and inodes and so on. Um, there's several different types of objects that are very similar to the fast file system. And if you know how to uh, produce your system in a way that uh, looks like it has these items, then it can be li linked in with VFS. And pretty much um, any file system that you can think of has been uh, designed to fit in with VFS. Okay. So uh, with that in mind, that means that the client that's using remote file systems thinks that it's just you know, going into the kernel with the POSIX open, read, write, close standardly, but those uh, actions, the file system are getting translated remotely. And so let's ask ourselves, what does that look like? And so a simple idea would be that when we do a read, um, well, maybe an open actually opens the TCP channel underneath and establishes the RPC system. And now when we do a read, that's an RPC that goes to the server and it returns the result, which is data. Or when we do a write, it's an RPC that goes to the server and it returns an ACK, which is data. And it just looks like a procedure call or, you know, a, an extended system call if you want to think of it that way. Okay, so it's a remote disk and um, no local caching. Uh, or maybe there's some caching at the server side, but in this simple example, we're not trying to deal with client caches. And the question might be, okay, the advantage of this is that it's extremely simple. Uh, server basically provides a completely consistent view of the file system to multiple clients. So we build this RPC system call layer to basically just uh, call the regular um, file system calls that are at the server side, and uh, we can implement the VFS to basically translate calls across the VFS layer into the right RPCs and we're done. The, diff, you know, the downside is that, uh, yeah, this is simple, but it's uh, so simple that it doesn't perform well. Um, going over the network for pretty much every read and write is gonna be painful, okay? And the server becomes a serious bottleneck when we know that uh, reads are often cacheable and uh, we would like to have some cache that's on the client side and this particular simple view of the world isn't providing that for us. So what can we do that's different? Well, let's put some caches in, okay? So if we put use caching to reduce the network load, uh, in practice, we're gonna use the buffer cache actually at the source and the destination. So really what we're saying is let's figure out how to do this in a way that doesn't disable the buffer caches uh, caching of items across the network, okay? Because in this previous kind of hypothetical, we were somehow getting no advantage of any buffer cache 
in our RPC system. So let's put it back. Okay, so we put some caches in the system. We've got some at the server side. Um, and uh, there's a question of what's, what are some examples of distributed file systems in use? I'm gonna show you NFS in just a second. Um, so the NFS uh, file system is very common. AFS is common. Um, you've probably been using that anytime you mount your home directories um, at Berkeley. Uh, there are many other types of file servers that are out there. And so, um, you know, so distributed file systems like this are definitely in common use, especially in the local area. So, uh, so the problems with uh, the simple ideas here are what about failure where the client cache, caches have some data that's uh, not committed at the server and the client fails, then uh, that might be a problem. So uh, remember, we have this uh, delayed write issue even uh, when we don't have network file systems, it gets even worse uh, because the latency is longer um, between the client and the server and uh, we have more opportunity here to lose data, okay? Um, so let's look at an example here. Cache consistency is, is yet another problem here. So if we try to read, uh, what happens is it's not in our cache to start with, because this is a cold read. The read might go across um, the network to the server. Uh, it reads something off of the file system into the server's buffer cache, uh, and now it's gonna return the, to the data and we'll put it in our buffer cache. All right, and so now subsequent reads are very fast because they're in the cache, okay? And now if we write, uh, we might write it in the cache here, and uh, notice what happens if the, uh, this client crashes, now we haven't updated the server, and we certainly haven't updated the client, um, and so that data is just plain gone. So not only does the client not know about the data, but uh, it's lost for all time. So what we really want to do is make sure that when we write, it goes through to the server, it gets written on disk, it's probably in the server's cache as well. And now uh, we get an ACK back. And at that point, maybe we get an ACK before we allow a write to go forward. And uh, as a result, if there's a crash, uh, the data is not lost, okay? Uh, but we still have a consistency issue because notice that um, we're still reading uh, from this cache and um, client one hasn't seen the updates. So the fact that we did get the data to the server is good from a um, durability standpoint, but it certainly isn't helping us make sure that the client, uh, the other client sees our updates. So this is an inconsistent problem with our data. And uh, this is just the beginning of issues that can come into play when we have more than one client talking to the same file service, okay? So uh, notice also that a read from F1 at the client gives us V1, a read from F1 at the, the excuse me, at the first client gives us V1, and the second client gives us V2, and so that's another example of our inconsistency. So how do we uh, deal with that? Well, let's see if we can deal with failures for a moment. What if the ser server crashes? Can the client wait until it comes back and just keep making requests? Well, the changes might be in the server's cache, but not uh, in the disk are lost. Uh, yeah, we just saw that. So that might be okay. Uh, maybe what we need to do is make sure that every write is always flushed all the way to the server before we go forward. So what if there's a uh, shared state across RPCs, client opens the file, then does a seek, server crashes, the client now tries to do a read, at that point, if the server has forgotten where we're seeked to, where we have seeked to, then we've got a problem, okay? Uh, or what if the client removes a file, but the server crashes before an acknowledgement, is the file gone? So this is uh, just, you know, many interesting failure problems start coming up. So one way to, to com combat that is what we call a stateless protocol, which is a protocol in which all the information required to service a request is in the request. So a great example of where that might be is rather than having the seek pointer in the server, we make sure that every read just says, what offset from the file do we want to read from? Okay, all right, so that would be an example of a stateless protocol. Even better would be one where it's idempotent, which really means that we can keep resending the same client request over and over again, and, and the result will be the same, and it won't change uh, the result on the server, okay? Um, 
So if the client time, times out without uh, hearing a reply from the server, it just reruns the operation again, and it's safe if we've made sure things are identified. So if you remember with HTTP, uh, what happens uh, in the simplest case where you go to a server and nothing's happened, or you don't see an update, everybody knows about hitting a refresh. Well, that's an example of, uh, of a stateless protocol. And in fact, they're cookies that are stored on the client that are resubmitted with each request. And that's kind of a way of keeping all of the state that we need for our actions to be kept at the client side, not at the, at the server side. And as a result, the protocol is stateless. So the NFS file system, network file system, was uh, one of the first really popular network file systems. Um, it's been around for 30 years now, and it defines an RPC protocol for clients to interact with the file server. So how to read and write files, traverse directories, et cetera. It's stateless to simplify the failure cases, keeps most operations identified. Um, so even removing a file, so if you, ref, you, know, you, you could return, uh, so if you try to remove a file and you don't get the act back and you remove it again, uh, you get back an advisory error saying the file's missing to basically allow idempotent retries, okay? You don't buffer uh, writes on the server-side cache, uh, and you reply with an acknowledgement only when modifications are reflected to disk. So one of the ways that the original NFS kind of tackled the lost state problem is it made sure that all writes are flushed to disk at the remote side, which was unfortunately slowed it down quite a bit, but gave you uh, a nice uh, reliability um, semantics. Uh, here was the architecture. And if you notice, we've got VFS right here in the middle, which be basically says that there's a system called interface, which goes through VFS, as we just mentioned. And that VFS layer may go to all types of uh, local file systems, um, Unix and, and MS-DOS and NTFS and otherwise. Otherwise, if it's an NFS-mounted file system, it'll go to the NFS client, which uses uh, the XDR version of RPC. This was one of the uh, first very popular ones. And that RPC goes across the network and makes uh, remote procedure calls to the NFS server, which now goes into the VFS interface and talks to the remote uh, file system. So um, VFS, the original VFS layer was actually part of NFS, as was the original XDR RPC was part of NFS from Sun Microsystems. So there are three layers. There's the file system interface I told you about, the VFS layer, and the NFS server layer. I just showed you that. The protocol is RPC for file operations on the server, reading and searching directories, manipulating links, et cetera. And it's write through caching, which basically means modified data is committed to the server before results are returned to the client. Um, so you, get, you lose some of the advantages of caching on the write side uh, because the performance of write can be long. Um, and the one thing I haven't told you about, though, is you need some mechanism for readers to eventually notice changes. Okay, and we need to fix that. Uh, the servers are stateless, so every request provides all the arguments for ex execution. I told you about rather than assuming there's a seek pointer at the other side, we do something like read at uh, a particular I number and position, not read at a file. Okay. And there's also no need to perform open or close on the file because uh, the client is know, knows something about the format of inodes and so on at the remote side. Everything's idempotent, which means you can retry it uh, and multiple requests at the same time. I already said that. The failure model is somewhat transparent to the client's uh, system. In fact, you can even mount NFS in a way that uh, if the server goes down, the client just locks up until the server comes back and things just transparently keep running. Um, that wasn't great uh, as a transparency because you really want to know that your server is down so that you can do something else. And uh, so in fact, most people mount NFS now with what's called a soft mount so that if the server goes down, uh, your process just uh, fails with a uh, with a read error or a write error rather than just locking until the, uh, the server comes back. So let's uh, talk about consistency here. I want to make sure we get some consistency discussion before we end today's discussion. So the NFS protocol is a weak consistency protocol. The client uh, polls the server periodically to check for changes. Um, if the data hasn't been checked in the last three to three, uh, 30 seconds, 
uh, it knows it needs to check. Um, and then when a file is changed on one client, the server is notified, but the other clients wait a little bit before they find out. So in this scenario we showed you earlier, where uh, client two had basically already written a new value to the cache, and client one uh, had an old value in its cache, what happens eventually is uh, this client will poll and say, well, is F1 still OK, uh, or has it not changed since I last saw its update? And at that point, uh, the server will say, no, 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 there's a new value, and it'll get updated in the cache. And now the client gets new data. But notice that this is a weak consistency. So it means that data uh, takes a little while before uh, all the other clients in the system uh, know that the data is, uh, has been updated. OK, so um, that kind of leads us to, an, you know, is this something that you could deal with? All right, what if you're making some changes to some parts of a file and then you try to immediately compile it on the other side? What happens? Is weak consistency OK? And uh, that leads us to this question of sequential ordering constraint. Yes, I see uh, on the chat somebody says tiers. Yeah, fortunately, the time, timing is set up these days so that you mostly don't notice this. But what sort of cache coherence might we expect from the file system? OK, so here's an example um, on the local file system where you have client 1, 2, and 3, where a read, um, say we start out with A in the contents, and a read gets A. Uh, and at some point, client 1 starts writing B. And client two is reading during this time frame. And at some point, maybe it gets A or B. Uh, and then eventually it writes C. And then what does client three C? Well, it might see parts of B or parts of C and so on. And so this is actually a bit confusing, right? It's sort of what does it mean to see parts of B or C, especially if you're talking at block level where uh, a write might span multiple blocks. OK, so what might we actually want? Um, assuming we wanted a distributed system to behave exactly the same as if all of the processes are running on the same system, then what you'd want is if a read finishes before a write st uh, starts, uh, you get the old copy. Otherwise, if a read starts after the write finishes, you get the new copy. And then otherwise, maybe you get the new or the old copy. Uh, that's kind of the semantics you get under normal circumstances. But for NFS, if a read starts more than 30 seconds after a write, you get the new copy. Otherwise, you get a partial update. You can see that this, these semantics might not be quite what you want. And so this 30 seconds is too long. Okay? And the, ver the various versions of NFS, as it's gone from version 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, have introduced new mechanisms, faster updates, and so on to try to make this uh, more consistent. And we'll pick this up next time um, with the Andrew file system, which will be another option on this. And then we're going to move into um, talking about distributed file systems. Uh, in particular, we're going to talk about uh, the CORD protocol. All right. And anyway, so for now, in conclusion, we've uh, talked about how to get something like a reliable byte stream between two processes on different machines over the internet you know, allowing us to do read, write, flush on the byte stream. It uses a window-based acknowledgment protocol, which we talked about, and congestion avo avoidance uh, automatically adapts the sender window to account for congestion in the network. Um, and uh, basically, this is why TCP is uh, a good neighbor protocol, because it automatically adjusts the amount of data that's outstanding uh, flying through the network to try to, on, on the one side, uh, fill as many of the queues as possible from destination, from source to destination to get high throughput. But on the other hand, back off when other people need that bandwidth. We talked about remote procedure calls in some detail, which is the calling a procedure on a remote machine or in a remote domain, providing the same interface as a procedure, and um, automatically packing and unpacking arguments without the user having to deal with that. That's in the stub. And it's, uh, there's a special compiler and a, a domain language IDL that lets you specify what the arguments are and, and return values are for the various procedures you want to call. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, and the other thing about RPC is it adapts to Andeanness and other details at the destination between the destination and source. We also talked about what a distributed file system might look like, giving you transparent access to files stored on a remote disk. We talked about the virtual file system layer, which allows you to attach multiple different types of file systems into one system, such that the same POSIX uh, user API still works. And we started to see the interesting problems with cache consistency, keeping client caches consistent with one another. All right, and we showed you how the NFS uh, action works, which is a polling system. We're gonna see some better semantics with AFS next time. I'm gonna leave you now. Um, I re and NFS is still very common now, yes. Um, it's in common use. Uh, that was a question on the chat. So I'm gonna leave you guys and we'll pick this up on Tuesday and uh, we will go to much more distributed file systems uh, on Tuesday. You have a great evening and um, have a good weekend. Talk to you later now, bye.